Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're hopping right back into part 2 of our serial killer deep dive into Gary Ridgway. If you haven't seen part 1 yet, I highly recommend watching that one first. But with that being said, let's get into it. Police in Washington state believe they found the remains of another victim of the so-called Green River Killer. The victim, identified Monday as 17-year-old Cindy Ann Smith, was last seen in March of 1984. Police believe that Smith is the killer's 37th known victim, all of them women ranging from 16 to 36 years of age. The murders began in summer of 1982, and since then, an army of detectives and a multi-million dollar computer system have been unable to crack the case. Once on the radar of the task force, they started interviewing people around Gary Ridgway. They also talked to the witnesses who had last seen some of the victims. Some were even able to pick him out of the photo lineup tentatively. Many reports had the suspect using different colored pickup trucks, and Gary had a maroon truck. But they learned that he had access to his brother's blue vehicle, as well as his father's truck at the time. In this country, in Washington state, still another victim has been identified in the nation's longest list of unsolved murders, the Green River Killings. 37 women have died, nine missing, all thought to be victims of the same killer. John Sandifer of KING-TV in Seattle has the latest. It was a familiar routine for the Green River Task Force, sifting through any remaining evidence at a site where someone, in this case three young boys, had stumbled across human remains. After the passage of three years, they would not find much more than a skeleton. Late Monday, the remains would be identified as those of 17-year-old Cindy Ann Smith, last seen in March 1984, hitchhiking from her mother's home to that of her sister in Seattle. She is victim number 37. Cindy disappeared from a strip of highway south of Seattle, where no fewer than 18 other young women, mostly prostitutes, dropped out of sight beginning in the summer of 1982. The first grisly discoveries of their bodies was along the picturesque Green River, hence the name that has come to represent untold horror to many in the Northwest. The Green River murders have included victims ranging in age from 16 through 36. Most of their bodies have been recovered in wilderness dumping grounds in groups of two, three, and up to seven. The Green River Task Force has employed up to 50 full-time detectives and a multi-million dollar computer system to crack the case. They have served at least two search warrants, but as of this morning, the killer remains unidentified. And Cindy Smith's disappearance was the last one in this area three years ago. Gary Ridgway would be interviewed several more times over the next few years. At one point in 1984, he would be brought in for a polygraph asking if he knew anything about the Green River killings and if he'd met any of the victims. He passed the polygraph, saying he didn't know anything about them. In 1987, Ridgway was served with a search warrant for his home, including several vehicles, his person, and his workplace. They found Ridgway at his workplace when they served the warrant. The search warrant was given because they'd found metal fragments consistent with ones found at Kenworth Trucking. Green carpet fibers were also found on several bodies, and interviews with people who had been inside his home reported seeing similar carpets in the bedrooms. What they were hoping to find more than anything else were victim trophies. Serial killers are often profiled keeping trophies as a reminder of their kills and an ability to relive their fantasies. After searching everywhere, his home, backyard, work locker, and several vehicles, they could not find anything that directly connected him to any of the victims. They did, however, get one piece of evidence they hoped would help. They got Ridgway to chew on a cotton ball, and they had his saliva. Even though the task force was very suspicious of Ridgway, with no evidence being found that directly connected him to the victims, they were not able to take him into custody or charge him with any crime. From the saliva sample taken from Ridgway, they hoped that at the time, in 1987, they could get a blood type and match it to the blood type found on the bodies of the two victims in 1982. They were able to get a definitive match, but evidence would be put in the freezer in the hopes that they could use it in the future. In the late 1980s, the task force was reduced due to budget cuts, with no concrete suspects and over thousands and thousands of man-hours devoted to the project. 
It cost more than $15 million from 1983 to 1990 to run the task force. That did not mean that they stopped looking for answers on who killed what was believed at the time to be more than 40 women. In 1992, one detective remained working on the Green River Killer case, Detective Tom Jensen. Detective Jensen was left to review the case files and look into new tips. In 2001, almost 20 years after the first body was found, he got approval to get evidence retested with new DNA evidence and sequencing technology. In September 2001, they found a match to the DNA found on all three of the victims. After all this time, the DNA matched Gary Ridgway. On November 16, 2001, Gary Ridgway was arrested after trying to pick up a King County Sheriff's officer who was posing undercover as a sex worker. He had asked if she was dating and agreed to meet her down the road and was arrested on the spot. When being interviewed during his booking, he asked the detectives not to call his wife but said, quote, You can contact the Green River Task Force. They know me really well. On November 30th, 2001, he was arrested while leaving work for first-degree murder. Explorer scouts today found a fourth skeleton in a wooded area outside of town where three other skeletons were discovered this weekend. So far, 16 murders have been blamed on the Green River Killer. Most of the victims have been young prostitutes. This latest find would bring that gruesome total to 20, putting it among the largest mass murders in American history. In December 2001, Ridgway was charged with four counts of first-degree murder in the cases of Marcia Chapman, Opal Mills, Cynthia Hines, and Carol Christensen. His DNA was found in the bodies of all the women except for Cynthia Hines, but due to her being found so close to the other victims, they had no doubt that the same person had killed her. We've covered Marsha, Opal, and Cynthia's cases, but 21-year-old Carol Christensen was found on May 8, 1983, in a wooded area in Maple Valley. She was dressed, and her body had been posed. One of the only victims found this way. She was found on her back with two fish placed on her torso, a bottle of wine across her stomach, and sausages on her hands. She had also been strangled. Carol was last seen May 3rd, 1983, leaving her work at the Barn Door Tavern. She was supposed to return, but never did. Co-workers said she was known to hitchhike around the area. Later, Ridgway would be asked why he'd posed her this way, and he would say it was all an effort to confuse the task force at the time, that none of the items had a specific meaning, and that he'd redressed her and placed things he had in his house that he didn't care about. Gary Ridgway pleaded not guilty to all charges. On April 15, 2002, prosecutors filed a written notice that they planned to seek the death penalty. Over the next year, detectives and prosecutors would go over all the believed Green River cases, hoping to find forensic evidence to file possible new charges. They would send hundreds of pieces of evidence to be tested. While this was going on, the King County Superior Court put a charging deadline on March 28, 2003 to ensure the trial against Ridgway proceeded in a timely manner. Right before the deadline, a private laboratory found evidence of paint spears on two victims, Wendy Caulfield and Deborah Estes. The paint matched highly specialized paint used in Kenworth truck paint, where Ridgway worked. On May 30, 1988, Construction workers digging for a playground found the remains of 15-year-old Deborah Estes in a shallow grave in Federal Way, Washington. They found two pieces of clothing with the remains of a bra and fragments from a black sweater with metallic threads. A witness confirmed that she was wearing it on September 20, 1982, when she was last seen near a motel. Deborah was working as a sex worker at the time. Prosecutors would file three additional murder charges against Ridgway for the murders of Wendy Caulfield, Deborah Estes, as well as Deborah Bonner, the last of the victims found in the Green River, on March 27, 2003, the day before the deadline. Gary Ridgway would plead not guilty to the additional charges. The trial was set for July 2004. The Southern California sun, which brings beauty and brightness to San Diego, is in stark contrast to the growing darkness along the city's El Cajon Boulevard. Someone is killing the women whose lives are spent on that street. 
prostitutes, drug users. When 20-year-old Melissa Sandoval's body was discovered in May, dumped in a rural area, the string of unsolved murders of women in San Diego County reached 25. In your 18 years with this department, have you seen anything like this? Absolutely not, no. The killings have fallen into a pattern. Many of the victims had ties to El Cajon Boulevard. Most were prostitutes. Most were strangled. The victims were nude or partially nude. The bodies were dumped in clusters in rural areas near highways. It is a pattern chillingly familiar to other police on the West Coast. This is the Green River near Seattle, which gave its name to the worst string of unsolved serial murders in U.S. history. Female victims, most prostitutes, all believed killed by the same person. The five bodies of women pulled from the Green River starting in 1982 were only the beginning. With growing disbelief, police in Seattle's King County eventually tied the murders of 41 women and the disappearance of seven others to the same killer, a serial killer they have never caught. The hardest thing to, to come to grips with for a lot of us is that this could have occurred here in our community uh, for such a period of time and, and as we sit here, that person responsible is, is yet to be brought to justice. After reviewing hundreds of pieces of evidence and witness statements, they were unable to tie Ridgeway directly to any further victims. But shortly after the additional charges, Ridgeway's defense team came to the prosecution with a proposition. If they removed the death penalty, Ridgeway was willing to plead guilty to the seven counts of murder give details, and plead guilty to an additional 40 to 47 additional counts and serve life in prison without parole. Gary Bridgeway also said that he would provide candid accounts of his crimes in King County as well as direct detectives to undiscovered remains of the victims not yet found. In April 2003, the prosecution had a decision to make. They could go to trial with the seven counts and put it to the jury, hoping they would get the death penalty, or they could take the deal. Ridgeway would spend his life in prison, and more than 40 families and the task force would have answers they'd waited decades for. On June 13, 2003, the prosecution agreed to the plea agreement that would put Gary Ridgeway in prison for the rest of his life. Gary would provide information on all the crimes he'd committed in King County before and after the 1982 to 1984 killing spree. He would also show detectives locations of previously undiscovered remains and would give details only the killer would know of the official known victims. By identifying the unsolved murders, detectives were able to determine victims for which Ridgeway was not responsible and those cases could be looked at with an eye on a new suspect. The plea agreement contract included that if Ridgeway was not completely candid or if he failed to disclose any of the victims, he could face the death penalty for all of his crimes. Starting in June 2003 and continuing for five months, Gary Ridgeway was interviewed by the prosecution and task force detectives. Ridgeway would claim he killed over 60 women in the King County area. As part of testing his claim to have killed his victims, he led detectives to places he left bodies and gave intricate details not previously known to detectives that had worked that case for decades. He also led them to locations that were never originally attributed to the Green River Killer. He also took them to sites of previously undiscovered remains that were missing persons believed to be Green River Killer victims, including Pammy Avent, April Buttram, and Marie Malvar the teen he was previously questioned about in 1983. He gave details of remembering being interviewed about Marie. He had leaned against the door while being interviewed so that detectives would not be able to see the scratches she had left on his arm the day before. After they left, he had poured battery acid on the scratches to disguise them. He talked about how often he did things like that. If he got hurt while moving a body, He'd fake a work injury and go on workers' compensation. He said he didn't smoke or chew gum, but would often leave wrappers and butts, even motel flyers at crime scenes to confuse law enforcement. That he would hide scratches. In his interview, he would also admit that if he got scratched, he would cut the victim's fingernails to avoid detection. In 1984, Ridgeway wrote a letter to a local newspaper. It was typed, not handwritten. 
and it was titled, What You Need to Know About the Green River Man. It gave falsehood of what the person did for a living, saying he was a salesman. It also gave details of the crimes, including the fingernails being cut, which investigators did not know until told to them by Ridgway. The letter was sent to the FBI and was concluded not to be from the killer. Gary confirmed that it was, in fact, from him. One of the last things he did to try and throw off the task force was when he dumped two bodies in Portland, Oregon, trying to get the task force to believe that he'd moved on. During his 2003 interview, he first started by giving bits and pieces of information. Initially, he minimized his actions because he didn't want his friends or family knowing what he had done. Early on, he would claim that he didn't plan to kill women when he picked them up. He would wait until something had provoked him into a rage. He would later admit that he would always plan to kill the women once he picked them up, offering them more money than they'd ask for, because he knew he would never pay it, and that he might actually make money if the women had any cash on them when he killed them. He talked about how he would use the picture of his son to put his victims at ease, showing his ID covering his name with his son's picture below it. That was not the only way his son was involved. He would admit to picking up his second victim, 19-year-old Giselle Lavorne, in 1982 with his then 7-year-old son in the vehicle. He would pick her up for a date and she directed him to a spot. He told his son that he was going for a walk with the woman and to stay in the car, and once out of his sight, they would have sexual intercourse and that he thought he hurt his son. When she looked up from behind, Ridgway put her in a chokehold until she passed out. He then used his socks tied together, wrapped around her neck, and used a stick to tighten until he was satisfied that she would not regain consciousness. He went back to his son and dropped him off, returning later to dispose of the body. He also admitted to returning to the body days later, while his son was sleeping in the car, to have sex with the body post-mortem. He often took women back to his house and would show them his son's bedroom before he killed them. In the interview, he admitted that dozens of women asked if he was a Green River killer when they got in his car and before he killed them. He would use a small stature and picture of his son to explain he could never be the killer. Some would be reluctant to get into his vehicle because they believed he was a cop. He'd keep beer in his truck and offer it to them, saying that he wasn't a cop. He explained in the interview that these were not random spur-of-the-moment killings, that he would get in his truck and go out specifically with the intention of picking up sex workers to kill them. He said that he only ever picked up street-walking sex workers because they were less likely to be reported missing quickly. This is true, and it was often days or weeks after the women went missing that it was reported. You went to a lot of, uh, of work to create these bruises. Mm -hmm. And it sounds to me like you had a series of, of ruses that you had kind of in your hip pocket mm -hmm. that you would, you would bring out and you would use to make you appear normal to some of these women. Mm -hmm. um, and there had to be a way of you deciding, even though it was just like that, uh, which ruse would work with which woman. I mean, you had to have a way of feeling them out and... Um, saying, I think ruse number one, two, three will work with this woman. How, how, tell me, explain that process to me. Well, one of them was, as you, as I, they would, a uh, woman would get in the car. She's already in she's the car? She's in the car. Let's say she's always in the car, We're driving down the road, and she, first, she wants to see my ID. So I whipped out my ID, and with my ID would be my, I'd put my, finger over my driver's license to hide my name, mm -hmm. but on the opposite side was um, pictures, and a picture of my son. And then to uh, see my son, and they would know I was a probably normal person. But I you were using, really using your son as part of your ruse. Is only well, at the time I didn't want to picture my ex-wife there, so I had to have a picture of my son. Sure, you had to you, you had to make it sound good. I had a driver's license on one side, my ID, and then when I showed my and then the next paper, 
next picture was was my son. So that was, and uh, in the vehicle I had some, uh, always had some, not always, but had some of my son's stuff in there, you know, um, that he left in there, or some Star Wars or something like that, you know, so there was, it was uh, like a family setting. In your, every, in your vehicle? Yeah, so every time I opened up my wallet, there would be a picture of my son on one side, uh, you know, behind my ID, here's my ID, and I hide, hide my name, mm -hmm. flip it over, and there's my ID, and, uh, my son's picture on the back side, and they'd see that, and that would uh, lower any big defenses. Mm -hmm. And you know, kids' as toys, eight-year-old toys on the on the dash. The only thing that would be better than that would be to have your son in the car with you. That that would be a, a, a incredible ruse. Uh, that happened once. What happened? Uh, uh, it was uh, July 18th, I think it was my brother's birthday. That weekend I picked up uh, a woman on back, back highway and Matthew was next to me in the seat and she hopped in and and I took her over to uh, in the South, South Airport area and um, took her uh, into an area and uh, my son was there and I, I killed her. I'm real sure my son didn't see it, but that only happened one time. But that was a pretty good, pretty good ruse. Mm -hmm. So why didn't you do it again? Well, well for one thing, the um, I didn't want to my son to see it, see that happen again, because I was, I was, uh, that's when I was really um, killing a lot of them, mm -hmm. and uh, another thing, it never came to the opportunity to, uh, uh, again to do it, I didn't, I mean, uh, I had him in my truck, uh, one time he was sleeping and I picked up another prostitute that I didn't date her. Which way also said that he preferred to pick up young sex workers because they were more vulnerable and they didn't know the ropes. When they told him they'd only done this a few times, he believed it. He told them, quote, I talked to them before I had sex with them and she'd say, I've only done this a few times before. I mean, if she's 13 or 14 years old, you figure that's true. If you got one that's 20 and 25, the talks, the slang, and everything they say, I've only done this a few times, they probably got an arrest record and they're lying. But the young ones stood out more because they talked when they were dying. He did talk about how a few times, but not many, during his killing spree, that he'd pick up a sex worker intending to kill her, but that didn't happen often. He also sometimes would go through with a date in the hopes that the women would feel more comfortable in his car the next time he picked them up, and then he would take her back to his house and kill her. He often had intercourse with the victims before so that he could get them as naked and vulnerable as possible before he strangled them, and he always strangled his victims. Ridgway initially said in an interview that he had stopped killing in 1985 when he met his second wife, but the date changed when he admitted that he had killed women till his arrest in 2001 but his later crimes were amateur and much less frequent than his killings from 1982 to 1985. Ridgway had a hard time remembering specific victims. He remembers the killings, but not the faces of the victims. This is believed to be because of his psychopathy. They were not people to him. They meant nothing but property. He would remember where he placed the bodies, what time of day, and what the weather was like, but not who these women were. It says here, I killed the 48 women listed in the state's second amended information. In most cases, when I murdered these women, I did not know their names. Most of the time, I killed them the first time I met them. And I do not have a good memory for their faces. 
I killed so many women, I have a hard time keeping them straight. Is that true? Yes, it is. I have re the, the statement continues. I have reviewed information and discovery about each of the murders with my attorneys, and I am positive that I killed each one of the women charged in the second amended information. I killed them all in King County. I killed most of them in my house near Military Road, and I killed a lot of them in my truck, not far from where I picked them up. I killed some of them outside. I remember leaving each woman's body in the place where she was found. Is that true? Yes. Your statement continues. I have discussed with my attorneys the common scheme or plan aggravating circumstance charged in all these murders. I agree that each of the murders I committed was part of a common scheme or plan. The plan was I wanted to kill as many women I thought were prostitutes as I possibly could. Is that true? Yes. Your statement continues. I picked prostitutes as my victims because I hate most prostitutes and I did not want to pay them for sex. I also picked prostitutes as victims because they were easy to pick up without being noticed. I knew they would not be reported missing right away and might never be reported missing. I picked prostitutes because I thought I could kill as many of them as I wanted without getting caught. Is that true? Yes. Your statement continues. Another part of my plan was where I put the bodies of these women. Most of the time, I took the women's jewelry and their clothes to get rid of any evidence and make them harder to identify. I placed most of the bodies in groups which I call clusters. I did this because I wanted to keep track of all the women I killed. I liked to drive by the clusters around the county and think about the women I placed there. I usually used a landmark to remember a cluster and the women I placed there. Sometimes I killed and dumped a woman intending to start a new cluster and never returned because I thought I might get caught putting more women there. Is that true? Yes. He often talked about how it was his career to kill these women, but that they meant nothing to him. He spoke about how often he visited his victims after he dumped them and have intercourse with their bodies, saying it was a way of delaying picking up another live victim immediately. He often talked about the significant burden of having to dispose of his victims, having to find places for them. Ridgway said that if he killed them in his home, he would dispose of the body quickly, removing them within a half hour. He would often drag them with plastic or a rug to his door and back to his truck, put them in the back under the canopy, and he'd even turn the lights off to ensure that they didn't see him moving the body from his home. He had a set of rules he would follow when disposing of bodies. He tried never to leave a body where he killed them. He always drove to a secluded place to dump the body. He would pull his truck away and then walk back to drag the body deeper into an area. He almost always left them naked, so there was little physical evidence. In the case of the Green River victims, he said that he put the women at the bottom of the river because police already had found two of his victims and he didn't want them to have them. He considered these victims things, property, that belonged to him. Ridgway is believed to have taken this long to catch because he was extremely careful. Unlike other serial killers, he did not keep trophies and he didn't keep anything in his house or his person from the victims. 
He would, however, sometimes put pieces of jewelry he'd taken off of the victims and leave them in the bathroom of Kenworth Trucking. He had hoped that his co-workers would take the jewelry, and sometimes he would see some of those co-workers wearing his victim's jewelry. He also took the polygraph in 1984 without an attorney. He is believed to have passed that polygraph because of his psychopathic nature. It's designed to measure stress, and with that, he felt none. Even though he could not remember the women, he could remember what happened to himself or his property or where he left them with extreme detail. Ridgway also didn't have a racial preference. He did say in the interview that he preferred white women, but in the end, it was the kill that mattered, not what they looked like. 20 years and dozens of victims later, Gary Ridgway admits in a King County courtroom he is the Green River Killer. And that's what investigators, prosecutors, and those with loved ones murdered by Ridgway have been waiting a long time to hear. In a courtroom packed with the families of those he murdered, Gary Ridgway took a deadly place in U.S. history. And Mr. Ridgway, is it your desire to plead guilty to the 48 charges of aggravated murder in the first degree because you believe that you are guilty of each of those offenses? Yes. And that's the same answer Gary Ridgway gave 48 times. Yes, for each of the women he killed in one of the deadliest murder sprees in U.S. history. In court, he would say little more than that, letting a prosecutor read his disturbing account of so many murders. Well, that's where we're going to end part two. Come back tomorrow for the third and final part in this series. As always, if you want to support the channel, the easiest way is to hit the like button. You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. Other ways to support the channel by joining my Patreon or channel membership. I also have merch, and you'll find all the links in the description box, plus a few extras. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter for more. But with that being said, thank you so much for being here and supporting what I do. It's very appreciated. That's it for me. I'll see you all in the next one. Bye for now.